Why was it that on the 15th of May 1967, just before the Six Days War, and before the West Bank and Gaza fell into Jewish hands, that the Arab leaders at the behest of Jamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt mobilized their armed forces and called once again for the destruction of the State of Israel and the slaughter of its people in extremely clear Arabic language? What occupation was then at issue? Why did the Syrian leader at the time order his soldiers to attack Jewish civilian targets to pave the Arab roads with the skulls of the Jews? For the 19 years that Jordan controlled the West Bank and Egypt the Gaza Strip, the Arab world had the opportunity for establishing the Palestinian state in those territories and chose not to. Where were the leaders of the so-called Palestinian people? Why were these leaders definitely silent about the rights of the Palestinian people? In fact, where were the Palestinian people? Why did they not have an intifada against their Arab brothers' occupation? If the conflict is about Palestinian statehood, then why was there no talk whatsoever of a Palestinian state for all those 19 years during which period these territories were free from Jewish occupation? After the Six Days War, Israel tried immediately to enter into negotiations with the Arab world about the political future of the West Bank, Gaza, and all other outstanding issues. The usual intransigent response came from the Khartoum Conference of all the Arab states on September 1st, 1967, in the form of the infamous three no's, no peace, no negotiation, no recognition, again and again and again. It was always the Arabs who rejected any and all compromises with the State of Israel short of its destruction and elimination. Let us now look at the unanimously adopted UN Security Council Resolution 242 that was declared on the 22nd November 1967, establishing the principles that were to guide the negotiations for a final and lasting Arab-Israeli peace settlement. This resolution was a torturously negotiated compromise between competing proposals. Every letter, word and sentence in the resolution were fought over by all the parties concerned because of the immense implications contained in their meaning until the final version was declared because it contained several general, all-encompassing terms instead of the specific ones that the contending parties would not have accepted. As usual with our chapters, we do our best to use logic as well as facts to come to our statements and conclusions. All the quotes that I shall make can be substantiated by all of you on the Internet from the United Nations archives. The first and most contentious point addressed by the resolution is the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war. The Arabs and their supporters very conveniently and for obvious reasons read 242 as though it ends here and hence as far as they are concerned, the demand that Israel should withdraw from all territories is proven. Well, ladies and gentlemen, nothing could be further from the truth. On the contrary, this clause does not do such thing, because the reference clearly applies only to an offensive or aggressive war and not to wars of self-defense. If this were not the case, the resolution would then actually provide an incentive for aggression because if one country attacks another and the defender repels the attack and acquires territory in the process, then the former interpretation would require the victim, that is the defender, to return the land it took back to the aggressor. Thus, aggressors would have little to lose since there would be no penalty to pay for their aggression as they would thus be insured against the main consequences of defeat. Moreover, the resolution calls for the withdrawal of Israeli forces from territories occupied in the recent conflict. And this is linked to the second unambiguous clause calling for the termination of all claims or states of belligerency and the recognition that every state in the area has the right to live in peace within secure and recognized boundaries free from threats or acts of force. The resolution does not make Israeli withdrawal a prerequisite for Arab action. On the contrary, they are linked to work together to achieve a peace settlement. Nor does the resolution specify how much territory Israel is required to give up since the Security Council language deliberately omitted the, the use of the term all the territories occupied during the Six Days War. 
The U.S. ambassador to the United Nations at the time of formatting Resolution 242 was Arthur Goldberg, who explained the notable omissions, which were not accidental in regard to withdrawal, are the words the or all and the June 5, 1967 lines. The resolution speaks of withdrawal from occupied territories without defining the extent of withdrawal. Furthermore, and even more important, is the fact that for Israel to withdraw, there had to be a peace settlement in the first place, since the ultimate goal of Resolution 242, as expressed in paragraph 3, is the achievement of a peaceful and accepted settlement. The Arabs demanded that Israel should abide by the UN resolutions while their Khartoum declarations of no peace, no negotiation, no recognition were still in operation. Once again, I would like to point out to you some obvious points that most people miss while reading the hundreds of pages regarding the issues above. In the whole of Resolution 242, there is no mention of an entity called Palestine. There is also no mention of a Palestinian people. There is no mention of Palestinian refugees. There is no mention of Arab refugees. Nowhere does it require that Palestinians be given political rights or territory. In fact, the resolution used the generic term refugees as a deliberate acknowledgement that two refugee problems were the product of Arab aggression against Israel from 1948 onwards, one Arab and the other Jewish. After the 1973 war, when Egypt's Anwar Sadat made peace with Israel, Israel withdrew from every occupied inch of the Sinai. Thus, at a stroke, Israel withdrew from 91% of all territories under the 242 resolution. As usual with Arabs and Muhammad and Islam, for making peace with Israel, Al-Sadat was assassinated. And again, once more, when in 2000, at Camp David, Yasser Arafat rejected without making a counteroffer at all, Israel's proposal of 95% of the West Bank and Gaza, as well as land compensation for the remaining 5%, his intransigence was wholly consistent with Arab rejection of any Jewish presence at all in the Middle East. If the Arab-Israeli conflict is about a Palestinian state, then there has always been an obvious solution of two states living in peace side by side. The conflict is in reality more fundamental and therefore all the more intractable and is actually about Arab rejection of the very presence and existence of a Jewish state and probably any Jews at all in the heart of a Mohammedan Muslim Middle East. By the way, this rejection by the Mohammedan Arabs also includes the inadmissibility of having a Christian majority state such as in Lebanon or even in the final analysis any Christians in a totally Muslim Middle East. Furthermore, the Charter of Hamas calls for the murder of all Jews worldwide, and rockets from Gaza continue to target Israeli civilians even after Israel's evacuation. Threats of genocide and a second Holocaust, together with the denial of the first, emanate from Iran. And the Arab world is awash with the most rabid and pernicious anti-Semitism. The war directed against the State of Israel is really part and parcel of the global war waged by fundamentalist Mohammedan Islamic tyranny against freedom and democracy. Israel is being made the first scapegoat because of its small size and vulnerability. Hence, all those who believe, with the best of intentions, that they are defending a vulnerable victim, that is, the Palestinians, are actually being complicit in one of the worst injustices in the history of human civilization. They will have sided with the forces of death and destruction, of fear and prejudice. What if the world is siding against the only beacon of freedom and democracy in the Middle East, thereby endangering us all? Because the fate of the Jews is often a sign portending the future. Hitler came after the Jews first, and then he attacked the world. Hijackings were attempted against Israeli airlines and then to all and any airlines in the world. Suicide bombings began in Jerusalem and then migrated to New York, Bali, Madrid, London and Nairobi. The Jews and Israel are only the litmus paper used by the fundamentalist Mohammedan Islam as a precursor to world domination and subjugation. After Israel and the Jews come the Christians, Hindus, Buddhists, animists, and all other unbelievers. As we speak today, the Christians in the Muhammadan lands from Pakistan to Iran, 
from Chechnya to Kosovo, from Iraq to Lebanon and from Egypt to Sudan, from the Philippines to Indonesia, are being murdered, exiled, kidnapped, tortured, dispossessed, humiliated and or eradicated with not a whimper of objections in the United Nations, the Western media or Christian clergy. Their silence is deafening.